And we are live. Welcome, folks. Monday morning. Uh, I have been doing, on occasion, some Outback with Jack episodes, uh, both on Monday and Friday instead of just Friday. We will not do that today. If you saw the uh, title for today's episode, we're going to talk about unlocking chains that are on you, whether you can see them or not. And I've talked about this before, um, but most Americans, most Westerners, most people in the world, in fact, are slaves. And there's a lot of different ways to define that slavery. One would be really simple. Uh, we're heading up to tax day, and the fact that that's even a thing means that somebody owns a portion of your labor. And if you are my slave, of course, I own, if you're my pure slave, I own what? 100% of the product of your labor. I may even, slaves often get paid. I don't know if you know that or not, but like in classical slavery, slaves often had some form of a wage and they got paid. Still didn't mean that they weren't a slave because I owned you. I chose how much to pay you, if to pay you, when to pay you. And I owned you like livestock. So what is the case when you are in a situation where somebody owns the right to 30% of your labor or 40% of your labor or 50% of your labor or more? And, and the reality is for most Americans that, that don't do the types of things I'm going to talk about today, it, the, the state owns more than half your labor. When you look at all the ways in which they tax your productivity, capital gains tax is a tax on your capacity to take risk. Property tax is a tax on your capacity to actually own and maintain property. Income tax is a tax on your ability to actually earn a living and do something productive in exchange for it. And sales tax is a tax on, another tax on the product of your labor when you then spend it. So it's a double taxation event. And every other tax fits in there somewhere. So most people are at least 50% slave to the system. But you're far more a slave than you think you are. That's what we're going to talk about today. It's not just about being a slave and having a portion of your labor taken from you. It's all the other entanglements. The slavery of your mind, the slavery of your spirit. We could think of that as emotional slavery. The slavery of your capacity to learn and what you learn and how you learn it. The slavery of the need to be employed versus the ability to earn a living, right? And, and there's multiple ways that we are enslaved. And we're gonna talk about that today. I'm also gonna do something a little bit different today. Generally in the live feeds and videos, I do not actually do the intro outro. I'm gonna actually do the intro out outro today, which means you'll hear the sponsor spots and stuff like that. I don't know if I'll keep doing this, but I'm gonna do it today. It'll save me time. It'll make everything easier. It basically eliminates all editing and putting the audio version out. And hey, you should hear about our sponsors because our sponsors are cool. And my sponsor segments are usually two sponsors a day and 30 seconds each. And probably some people you want to hear about today as well, because they also have something to do with your freedom and liberty and your ability to defend it. Sponsor of the day number one today is Jam Bullion. Jam Bullion is the place that I get all my silver and gold, and I think you should too. And the reason is, one, they support this show. Two, they cost less than Monix and Atmix, et cetera, for the same silver and same gold. That's the point of silver and gold. It's the same. It's fungible. An ounce of silver is an ounce of silver. An American silver eagle is an American silver eagle. So why pay more for the same thing? You can get it for less at Jam Bullion. I can talk directly to the president if I need to and solve a problem if one comes up. They give you a discount. And all orders over a couple hundred bucks ship free. Uh, so there's really no reason not to buy from Jam Bullion when you're stacking silver and gold. And while I'm big into cryptocurrency, I'm also big into precious metals. I am not a one or the other guy. I'm a true diversity guy. And I've been re recommending you keep about 5% of your net wealth in silver and or gold. Since I started this show back in 2008, that recommendation has not changed. And I've been recommending JM Bullion to do it with since 2011. That recommendation has also not changed. And there is a reason. Next up today is BulkAmmo.com. Hey, I know you guys are fans of uh, firearms. Just on that. I'm never far from a firearm. This weapon that I'm holding in my hand, this 357 lever action, is not loaded right now. I'll clear it for you on air, right? Uh, so what that makes this this weapon, if I don't have, um, if I don't have ammo for this somewhere, this is an expensive club. That's that's all that it really is. It, it comes down to it being an expensive club, unless I actually can put ammo in it and actually have it perform the function of a firearm. Or maybe it's a barter item. 
something I can sell or barter with. That's about all that it is. We need ammo to run our weapons. If you don't have ammo, what you have is an expensive, very expensive club. There's there's other ways to have a club. So you want ammo. You want lots of it. And I really think you should check out uh, bulkammo.com for all your needs because they have the ammo, they have it in bulk, and they ship it so fast you'll wonder why you even go to a store to buy your ammo anymore. And what's the first thing? What is the first thing that dries up when gun grabbers come out and start talking about firearms regulations? It's not the guns themselves, is it? No, it's the ammo. The ammo is what goes in short supply, ammo and magazines. So make sure you stock up on both. Bulkammo.com for your ammo and get your discount if you're an MSB member. All right, with that, let's go ahead and dive on into this, guys. And uh, I want to start out since we're going to be kind of deep today and we're going to kind of uh, go into some darkness and, and, and lots of solutions go along with it. Start out with something that's just light, just something fun. So I want to show you a picture I just shared on social media. And I want you to take a look at it. And I just want you to guess in the sub, in the uh, the uh, chat if you want to try. And if you're on uh, the audio, I'm sorry, I guess you, you can't really see the picture. But it's a picture of something that I added to one of my pond systems today. And it's my 8x16 pond that... Uh, that, the, that provides for the ducks and the ducks provide for it. It's that system I've talked about over and over again. You can see the recent expansion of the new 150 gallon square tanks. But then you see in the background, you see a 10 foot trough feeder. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to how that feeder fits in to the next phase of the expansion of that system? Something light, just something to think about. And now let's get on into this. So, there are more than 10 chains that are placed upon the average person in society today by the system. And I really focused on these 10 because of the ones you can do the most about. And I want you to understand something else. I put system in things like titles because it makes it easier for people to understand what you're talking about. People say the system, right? It's really not the system. It's the systems. The societal systems of control are multi-tentacled, like a squid, because it's far more innate. So it's like this massive science fiction squid, like that makes the Kraken look like a baby. And it entwines your life and it controls you. And you can see it every time that you don't want to do a thing or you, you, you don't want to do a thing and you do it anyway. Or you do want to do a thing and you don't do it. And there's actually no law that says you have to or says you can't. You feel this really deep compulsion, right, to go along with what society says. Young people often feel it when they come to the end of their high school career and they feel like they have to go to college. Their parents say it. Their teachers say it. The TV says it. The government says it. People are throwing money at them. And many people, when they get to that point in their life, it's a really good path for them. And for a lot of other people, it's a terrible path. But a lot of people just don't want to do it, but they do it anyway because they don't know what else to do. And that's what they're told to do. And it's just a good example. Most people can relate to it. Most people, even that didn't go, you probably got to a point where you were at that decision in your life. Even if you chose to go to trade school, just get a job, join the military, whatever you chose to do instead of go to college, you probably felt like, man, I'm, I really should do this. And that is a system of control. And it's what you call the monkeys policing the monkeys. And that's mainly how society is actually controlled. They plant things in your head, belief systems that may or may not be good for you. It's just what you think you need to do. And they know a certain percentage will do it. And the higher that percentage becomes, the more peer pressure there will be to compel you to become part of it. And the higher that percentage will go over time. And I broke that down again today into 10 different sections, 10 different systems of support that, that work this way, that operate this way. Some we really need for now, at least. Some we will probably not get in mass to a point where we completely disconnect from them. We're going to have to disconnect from these systems in two totally different ways. And the, the term I'm going to give you for both of them, or the two terms I'm going to give you are often used interchangeably. 
And it's a big mistake for preppers. It's a big mistake from a standpoint of lifestyle design to use them as, as though they are similes. They're not. They're very different. They're self-reliance and self-sufficiency. We measure them differently. And if you measure something differently, then it is inherently different. If they're the same, we would measure them the same way. So self-sufficiency means I don't need you at all if I'm 100% which leads us to exactly how we measure it. We measure self-sufficiency in a percentile. If you need, I don't know, 20 kilowatts of energy a month, just a random number, doesn't matter. It could be a thousand, could be one. And you produce, let's, but it's, let's say it's 20,000. And you produce through some alternative means 10,000 uh, 10, kilowatts a month. You are 50% self-sufficient. Because whatever you've done, it goes on forever. It goes on long enough, the 25-year life cycle of your solar system, that you're good. You're, you know, for the foreseeable future, and you have plenty of time to upgrade in the future. So you're 50% self-sufficient. If you're self-reliant, it's for a time. Instead of percentile, we measure it in time. So if your solution to your energy issue is, I have a generator. I have parts for a generator so I can maintain it. And it's reasonable that your generator will last at least as long as the reserve fuel you have. And you have enough fuel to run your generator to meet your electrical needs for 30 days. You have 30 days of self-reliance, but you have 0% for that need self-sufficiency. And that's something you, it, it's, it's very hard for people to understand that, that I can have tremendous self-reliance, but if I can measure it in time and there's a time where it definitively runs out, it's not self-sufficiency. It's self-reliance. If I give you wilderness training and you go are dropped off in a jungle somewhere where there's lots of food and you know how to make shelter, you know how to purify water, you know how to get food, you know how to do everything you need to survive, you are now 100% self-sufficient. And if you're not, then you'll die. That's how that's going to work. And so the first thing you're going to do if you're in that situation, after you, you see to your basic needs for the next few days, you're going to start assessing resources and you're going to start to go along with your self-sufficiency. If you're smart, if you're properly trained, you're going to build up your self-reliance in time. Because what happens when I go out and I hunt today and there's no game and I can't find anything, or I set my traps today and I go check my traps in the morning and they're empty. What happens when that creek that I, it's clean water, I can drink it. I don't have to do anything to it. I go out one day and it's full of mud. It's just, roaring mud and now I need to filter it and I don't have a way to do that because I'm, I'm literally running around like naked and afraid maybe I've made a loincloth out of a, a a coon skin that I that I from a coon that I killed or something but that's about it I'm living like a, my primitive ancestors and now the water's too muddy or it's unsafe to drink or we get a drought in the creek the little trickle creek stops running so it might be a good idea that while I'm in plenty I and this is what our hunter-gatherer ancestors did you you stock up so that if the self-sufficient system fails for a time that we can then have a reserve. And when self-sufficiency came from nature, the people that survived very quickly were people who figured out to build the self-reliance side. Now, what happened was, this is the story of your enslavement. People that wanted to control others figured out if we can build systems that replace natural systems and we sell them to the people, and then we build licensing and controls around those systems instead of just a free market for them, then what we'll end up with is a system of perfect control because they'll stop worrying about self-reliance and then they'll throw away self-sufficiency. And then all you have to do is turn it off or even just make them afraid that it'll go away and they'll give anything so that they can keep not just their needs, but their wants, like their avocado toast and their half-calf, half-decaf lattes. And even if you think you're immune to this, you're probably not. And as we go forward, you're going to see that you're not. Because the only way you're going to get to even a 25% of success here, which is a great goal, by the way, 25% of self-reliance and 25%. I know I said we do self-reliance in, in, in time, but 25% of your time over a year. So a three-month self-reliance backup and 25% ongoing self-sufficiency in these areas, you get there and your freedom is about a hundred times higher than the average person. But here's the thing. It's important to understand 
you're not going to get to a point where you don't need the system at all, or you're definitely not going to get to a point where you probably don't use the system at all. If you were going to do that, you wouldn't be sitting here like so many preppers and saying, well, when the grid goes down and everything collapses, I'm going to run off into woods and I'm going to live on my own or some other bullshit you're going to pull out of your ass. Um, or at that point, we'll just cut the homestead off and we won't care anymore and we'll never leave and we'll stay here and defend what we have. If you were going to do that, when the shit hit the fan completely, you'd have done it now. And so many people have so many holes in their plan. Because they live in that fantasy world where they think, well, when it happens, I'm ready. But they're not ready now. And if you're not ready now, when you have access to all the systems that are enslaving you currently, like bored tentacles digging into your body, think of it like the Matrix, but you don't have one cord going into your neck. You have multiple cords. And we need to unhook them. But there's also good in what the system makes available. You know, who here has a guilty pleasure? I do. I won't even say what it is because it's not important what mine is. It's yours. Something that you like to eat or you like to drink. Like, I don't know, coffee. This isn't coffee. This is tea. But I drink coffee every morning. I'm not going to grow coffee in Texas. And if I do, I'm going to have to take extraordinary measures to grow coffee that won't be that good. Canadian Farms says sushi dinners. Well, unless you live somewhere where you can catch saltwater fish, Right. You're not going to have sushi dinners. Fred says coffee, right? We all have things that we like that come from afar. And until we have a total free market, which we're not going to in our lifetimes, then we're going to have to go inside the system to acquire those things. That's just one example. And how many of us want to live off grid, but we don't because it's cheaper and easier right now to live on grid? We better have a redundancy plan. But, you know, I'm not an off grid guy. Not yet. Not in this state. Now, with the, you know, if I could build an earth contact structure in this state, or I, not the state, but on my property, I probably could get off grid completely. I probably could. But an above ground structure here off grid with Texas summers, probably not going to happen. The amount of water I have to pump to make things go, probably not going to happen. So I have to move the self reliance quotient really high on the energy side because I have a weakness there. And I promise you, if I have a weakness in one of these 10 areas, you do too. Jonathan says his are Sour Patch Kids. That's his guilty pleasure. Probably not good for your blood sugar, but again, you're probably not going to make Sour Patch Kids on your homestead, and that's okay. I like sushi, too. Hunter's is saying, mmm, sushi, right? Hunter's, Hunter's F770. I love sushi. It is one of my true guilty pleasures. One of my coup de grace moments in the last couple of years was convincing my wife, who I've been married to going on 21 years this next month, and I've been with for over 25. We've been together for over 25 years to finally, the last couple of years, try sushi. And she likes it. She doesn't like all of it, but she likes some of it. So we can now go to have sushi together. And that is an example of me taking from the system. So what we want to do is move as many of our needs as possible outside the system control. And then have luxuries that we take from the system as we choose and conveniences. But it's really easy to gray, you know, kind of Venn diagram and put a lot of stuff in gray that we think is over here and we've already got it skinned and taken care of and we don't have to worry about it. And it's really in this overlapping Venn diagram. We both need it and we both want it and we don't have complete self-sufficiency in it and we're not going to. But it's actually not that hard to do. So here's here's the basic formula that I'm going to give you today for each one of these. All right. Make as much of our needs in critical to thrive areas as self-sufficient as possible. Again, we measure that in percentage. So there's things we need. And then there are things that we won't die if we don't have them. But if we really want to thrive as individuals, we need them. We don't need to live a classical type of education system. We don't even need a high-level education system. If we had parents or grandparents that could teach us to walk through the woods, and know what to eat and not eat, things like that, how to trap, <clears throat> how to hunt and gather. Mankind survived for that way longer than mankind has survived with any sort of modern education system. And I'm not even talking about the negative side. I'm just talking about any form, homeschooling, unschooling, any of that. We don't need it to survive, but we do need it to thrive. And so we need to figure out all the things we need to live to keep breathing and to really excel in the world. And we need to become a self sufficient with those as we can. 
Then we need to create redundancy for those needs and critical components that we can't be self-sufficient for 100% in time with our self-reliance. So I'll go as far as I can with self-sufficiency with this one chain that I'm tethered to society with, and I've broken a link in it. But it's it's still there. I can unhook it if I want to, but there's a consequence. But I have chosen to leave it hooked. The chain, the link of the chain is cracked. I can pull it off anytime I want. And because I might have to or somebody else might cut it off on me for a while, I want to put a time bank of self-reliance into the equation. So again, energy, if I'm 50% self sufficient for the energy I need, I need some self-reliance for the balance so I can last as long as possible until I figure out how to deal with that. Then I need to be honest with myself. Very important. We're honest with ourselves at what are we're still most vulnerable with. Where are my greatest weaknesses? And including the ones I'm never going to completely fix. People are still trying to guess the picture. I love this. That's why I did it, right? So um, I want to make sure that I, I know the places I'm weakest. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the areas that are the easiest to build up, which we have been tricked into believing are the hardest, but they're not, to build up more self-reliance because I can backfill if I need to. And the easiest place to build up self-reliance measured in time is with money, with wealth. So even if everything goes to shit, there's probably, and, I, and my generator dies, there's probably a way to fix it or get another generator or get more fuel. It might be really expensive. The more financial reserves I have that are stable financial, liquid stable financial reserves, the more I can do to get to bridge the gap with self-reliance. And then you partake at your discretion for your wants that the systems make easy to acquire, those guilty pleasures. The fact that once in a while I like to tell my wife, hey, it's Friday. The kids are the kids are gone early today back to their parents. If you don't know us, we have our grandkids here for homeschooling during the week. So it's Friday, half day for mommy. So the kids went home to mommy at noon. Let's go down to Gloria's Latin Cuisine and have a really badass lunch. We don't need to do that. There's plenty of food here. We do it because we choose to partake in it. And we know we're choosing to partake in it. We don't go do it just to do it. We do it because we've consciously decided we have surplus right now. And we want this experience, so we're going to go do it. And when you say that, and you talk about exiting everywhere that you can, including avoiding paying any dime in taxes, you do not have to. You know, it's specifically legal structure to avoid paying taxes. You get the whole people to give you the whole argument, right? Well, he's a libertarian. He rails against taxes. But look at him. There he goes in his sports car down that road that the government paid for. Well, first of all, dickhead, the government didn't pay for that road. I did against my will. And the fuel that's going through my car at that time that I'm paying twice as much for now that I was a couple of years ago because of stupid government policy is how I paid for that road. So you can just shut up and piss off. But the other side of this is I'm living my credo as, as a libertarian and anarcho-libertarian specifically that I should pay for the things that I, I choose to buy and through use fees or whatever, fine. But I should not pay for things that I don't want. So I'm just being true to myself. By the way, you know what I just gave you the formula for? This is going to blow some of y'all's minds when you really think about it and these two ends meet. I just gave you the formula for retirement. This is the freaking dream that American Express, Ameriprise, Charles Schwab, fill in the blank with your particular financial liar service, advertises on TV news every day. They show two people that are like 65 years, 70 years old. Dude's got gray hair, but he's a silver fox, right? He looks like, what's his name from the fashion company? Ralph Lauren or some shit. He's got his dress shirt rolled up on his sleeves. He's got good muscle tone, even though he's like 72 years old. Tan, short cropped haircut, kind of gray like me. No beard. Never had. You ever, never, ever notice they never have beards? His woman's walking alongside him. Her, her pretty, pretty tropical looking breezy stuff is blowing. Sun is setting. Well, that's what they promised. That you've built up enough self-sufficiency and self-reliance to live out your golden years. Great and wonderful, and have everything you need, not have to work anymore. 
All I'm trying to do is figure out how do we accelerate that and how do we start looking at retirement differently? Retirement, we think of as an off switch. This is a very recent phenomenon, about 100 years old at best. True retirement for the average person is a 100-year-old idea. What people did is as youngsters, they became valuable in their contributions, not to the world, not to the nation, not to the government, to their local families, local friends, and local communities. As they aged and they got older, they took more responsibility on, they did more things, and they contributed at a greater level locally. In their prime years, they worked their ass off, whether it was women in a traditional nuclear family raising kids and teaching and stuff like that, or men out breaking their backs, or doing more conventional business work, but they worked really, really hard. And as they got older, they started to hand over responsibilities and they took the percentage of their daily life that went toward these income generating opportunities and it went into a decline. It wasn't work your ass off till you're 71 and about to fall over at your desk and you get pushed out the door and you call it a retirement. You go from 100 to zero. And it's a very traumatic thing in the life of people to retire that way. It's very traumatic. Because it's, it's the same reason we have so much more problem with, and I know it's going to sound crazy, but it's the same reason we have so many more problems with PTSD today for soldiers coming home than we did in World War II. A lot of shit our guys saw in World War II, I'm not putting down or demeaning or belittling the crap that our men and women have gone through in recent conflicts. But a lot of the stuff the guys that came out of World War II saw made that look pretty light. I mean, walking over piles of dead bodies, both the enemy and the friendlies, piles. Getting to the point where you so devalued human life that there was a term called field stripping the enemy, which there's some dead guys. Let's go find anything useful on them and take it and just to, like, pretend they didn't even exist. Completely dehumanizing. But these men came home. They built the highways. They built corporate America. They built the technology that built the next generation of technology we use today. Right? That's what they did. And they have very low incidence of veteran suicide, PTSD, and veteran homelessness after World War II. And it's not because the social systems were stronger, because they weren't. And it's not just because the nation welcomed them home as heroes, because that's not the only reason. It's because when they got done with their job, they were surrounded by people like them. And most of them took about three months to get from the European or Asian continent back to America, surrounded by people just like them that went through the same shit, and they phased out of that life. Today, the guy's in Afghanistan watching his buddy get blown up. His time to go home comes. Click. Airplane two hops. He's sitting at home in Iowa. And this has been the case since the Vietnam War, that we've had this no decoupling. You're in it and you're out of it. This is how we have people retiring today. Full bore, all the way through to the end, and quit, and that thing in your life is gone. So wouldn't it be better if we could transition into self-ownership, or never go into the system if you're a really young person, and develop a solution where you decide when you start to phase down in how much you have to put in every day? I didn't really know I was going to talk about this when I set this up today. I want to get into those pillars that I promised you uh, about it, exiting the system. And I'll go kind of quick on them. There's 10 that I want to talk about today. Number one is the mental and emotional exit. These are all about exiting the system, at least partially. And they're not really in any order of importance. They're all equally important except this one. This is number one because this is the most important one. The mental and emotional exit from the systems. You know, John Bush is always talking about exit and build, exit and build. I'm speaking at his exit and build conference uh, next month. Well, what are you exiting? There's a physical exit. There's a financial exit, right? They're not the same thing. Moving is a physical thing. Getting your money out of their system, or at least partially out of their system, or so manipulating their system, the system actually serves you. Those are financial exits. Those are separate. But if you don't mentally exit, none of the rest of this matters. All you're doing is playing their game by their rules instead of their game by your rules. See, I like to use my own rules. My rules are I'll take any rules they have and I will I will bend them. I will break them. I'll freaking rape them. I will rape their rules if I can. 
And the more I can do it, the more I will do it. And the more it benefits me to do it, the more I'll do it. And when it benefits me to follow their rule to the letter, I'll do that too. That's my rule for me. I serve myself first because as a father and a grandfather, my family is the most important thing to me. So I take care of myself first so I can take care of them. Everything else is second after that. But that has to start with a mental exit. You know that feeling? Man, I really should pay attention to the news. You are physically, emotionally attached. You have a mental attachment to the system. There's an episode I did. It's worth looking up. You can find it at the Survival Podcast. It was before I started doing video versions. And it's called There Is No Sovereignty Without Mental Sovereignty. And that's what I'm talking about. You have to become fully emancipated in your mind and your spirit. Now, if you want to call your spirit your soul, you want to call it your your, your, your spirit, you want to call it your inner you, you want to call it your id, which is one of three forms of the psyche. I don't care what you call it. You choose that. I don't give anybody any religious or spiritual advice. I'm not in that business unless it's a totally separate discussion and we've agreed to have it. But whatever it is inside of you that you see, that we talk about spirit, and you know what I mean when I say that. If you don't sever the bond on that, everything else you do is mechanical and it's like going through the motions. It's like the guy whose wife bitched at him enough that he said, fine, I'll go to church on Sundays. He sings the hymns. He puts his hands up, you know, or if he's Catholic, he goes up and he receives communion. He does the sacraments. He goes to confession once a month or whatever it is. He says his Hail Marys, and all, but he doesn't believe it. That person's getting nothing out of religion. And they should either find it in them to, to partake in that faith for real or stop. Those are your two choices. But if you are still emotionally and mentally tethered to this belief that you owe some obligation to some mysterious entity known as society through some invisible thing called a social contract to do things you don't want to do when the thing you want to do is not going to physically harm another human being or steal the property of another human being, you do not have mental sovereignty. And I really, I want you to listen to this and I want you to see what you can do to move in that direction. But none of the, honest to God, none of the rest will help you until you get there. And you have to, the only way you're going to get there is a continuous process. It's like being an alcoholic. You have to decline the drink every day. Once you're an alcoholic and you know you're an alcoholic. You have to be able, the people are like, well, I just stay away from it. If that's what you need to do for now, fine. But you're not really separate until you walk into a room and everybody's having a beer and you have a Coke. That's hard. And the reason I brought it up is because it is hard. And what we're talking about doing here is harder because you weren't born one day old into a system designed to turn you into an alcoholic. Your mama didn't put a little bit of rum on the nipple of either her breast or the bottle the day she started feeding you. But your parents, through no fault of their own, unless they were already enlightened to these things, and most of us aren't, we're not born with it, and most of us never find it in our lives. We condition our children to obey the system. And we worry. If you think of your kid, well, man, if he does that in the future, like how's he going to get along? And he's not really hurting anything. That's that thing pulling at you. You got to develop your mental sovereignty first. If you don't, you can't become free. Because if I control your mind, what hope do you have? If I control your spirit and your soul, if I can put words in your head, and 10 years later, you're trying to make a decision for yourself and you even hesitate to make that decision when you know it's the right decision and you know it's not going to hurt anybody. And it's because I put those words in your head 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. How are you free? You're not. Next, the financial exit. The financial exit comes in two ways. One is we're going to use our system. We are going to invest in things that are inside the system, real property, equities, mutual funds, hedge funds, whatever. And what we're going to invest in has a lot to do with the time that we're making the decision, the amount of money we have, what our goals are. These are classical discussions with a good financial manager. I encourage you to look for someone that calls themselves a financial manager, not a financial advisor. Financial managers take an active role in actually designing 
and changing your investment allotment over time. And then you take a portion of what you're putting away for your future. And that's the portion they get to manage, not advice, manage. This may be difficult for many of you because if you don't have a sufficient net worth, it's hard to find a guy like this. You can probably figure out one to talk to, though, that's associated with this show. I'll leave it there. But you want a financial manager, not a financial advisor, because the other word for advisor, in my opinion, is financial liar. These people that are behind these commercials for Ameriprise and American Express and Charles Schwab and all this shit, the guys that work for them, they are not at all solid investment advisors. They are relationship salespeople. They have been trained to talk you off the ledge when you say, hey, some stupid podcaster said the market's about to crash. We should go into cash cash equivalents and say, no, 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 you don't want to do that. And they can't tell you why. They just know you're not supposed to. Or when you say you want to move to a different firm, they tell you not to go. That's what they're trained to do. They're t- trained to develop relationships, get referrals, give some third-party mothership your information, show you a pie chart, Put your money into it and get you to invest over and over and over again out of your paycheck. That's what they're that's what they're paid to do. You don't want those people. You got to be very selective when you go in to the systems and use their things. You have to be like the alcoholic in the bar drinking O'Doul's. You have to be in control or you can't do it. You're better off not. The other side of this exit, though, is precious metals, Bitcoin. Now, if you want to do anything else other than that, I'm okay with it. I have some other cryptocurrencies myself, and I have some other ways that I handle an economic investment myself. And if you're thinking business, you're on it, but that's not for this one. It's highly related. We'll get to it very soon. But Bitcoin and some form of precious metal investment, because both the precious metal investment and Bitcoin are outside of their banking system. Everything else we talked about up till now is in their banking system. You can say I'm diversified because I have mid cap and small cap and growth and income. And I even have some hedge funds or whatever. You know what you have? 100% denominated in dollars, paper securities. You have no diversity whatsoever. Okay? None. Zero. You don't have any. You have dollars. Now, Will equity in a company or group of companies in the form of an ETF outperform the dollar? If you buy right, absolutely, because inflation is going to eat the cash if we don't put it into some sort of risk assessment. But it's in their system. Go try to, if if you were shut down by the government from accessing banking and you have a half million dollars invested with Charles Schwab, good luck getting your hands on it. You see how that works? They can throw a switch. So we have to we have to balance inside and outside the system. So gold, silver, Bitcoin, everything else, guys, it's Vegas. It's Vegas. Doesn't mean gold, silver, and Bitcoin can't go up and down. Doesn't mean that under short term by uh, um, volatility. But it's where a good portion of your money should be planted and real property. Real property is land, dirt, terra firma. But you have to pay property tax on it. Do you? Do you? If your property makes you more money than the taxes, the taxes are efficiently, you know, it's basically a business expense. If I own the property and I rent it to you, I don't pay the property tax you do. There's a lot of ways to, to, to use real property without effectively paying the property tax. When you say if you own property, you have to pay the property tax. We're going to go back to point one, mental and emotional. You haven't exited mentally and emotionally yet. You haven't challenged your your mental computer with the question, computer, how do I own property and not effectively pay my property tax? Get somebody else to do it or amortize it against a business expense. How do I do that? But they put a salt limitation in. Your CPA sucks. That's all I'll say. If you think because of the salt limit, that you can no longer defer your property taxes and expense against your business, you need a new CPA because they do not know what they're doing. My little bitty CPA, she's a little bitty chick. She looks like the girl from um, Incredibles that made the super suits. Right? No cape. That lady, she looks like her. That woman is worth her weight in freaking plutonium, let alone gold. You better get your ass a good CPA if you think that way. So real property, precious metals, Bitcoin. Now, the real property exists in the system and not in the system at the same time. 
Because if I have the real property, I have ways I can leverage that property for income and ways I can liquidate that property that I can do it if I absolutely have to outside of their system. All right. Next, the employment exit. This is why I said we're going to hold off on investing and, and the financial exit, including your business, because it's separate. All the other things we talked about, they give you an ROI if you do it right. They give you a valuable asset. They give you a hedge against inflation. They do all types of things for you. But none of them, unless it's a huge amount of reserve that can produce a, an income flow, fully separate you from the need to go to work. And if it's real property and you're generating enough rental income to replace your, your work income, it becomes a business at that point. It truly becomes a business at that point. So having a business that pays enough that you don't have to ever punch a fucking time clock again is the most liberating thing that is easily acceptable in today easily accessible in today's world. Anybody that says it's really hard to build a successful business, you're right and you're wrong. It's hard because you have to do it. You have to suffer through it. You have to kill yourself to do it for a time. But remember we talked about how People come into the world and they start out as this young baby that's on its back. And, you know, it's, it's it's a major accomplishment to lift its head up. We go, wow, he lifted his head up and he pooped. Wow, he succeeded right today. This is a major good day for this child. Eventually, they pull themselves up. They walk. They start to grow up. They learn basic things. By their teens, they should be helping around on the homestead and stuff like that or the farm. But by the time you're like in your 20s, your early 20s, the only thing preventing you from success in running your own business, and because I, I know teenagers who have done it, is you. And that's when you can put the effort in to make it happen. And if you waited till you're 40 and it's harder now physically on you, tough shit. You're the one that wasted your dash. You get it done. But it's when I say it's the most accessible, it's the one that everybody can do. You know how I know it's so accessible? The sheer number of people I talk to that made mistakes in their lives bad enough that the state put them in a place called prison, not jail, prison. And they came out with a felony record. I know a lot of people that fit this description. And if they went out, they would have a hard time getting a job as a freaking bus boy in a shitty diner. And since they had nothing and no pathway and they didn't want to go back in that system, they figured out a path through entrepreneurship. And some of the people that I know that have that exact backstory are some of the wealthiest people I know in the world today, measured in dollars. One of them, I think, is listening to this right now. And if he wants to say who he is, he can. It's up to him. But I know people worth millions. I know people worth tens of millions that backstory includes spending five or 10 years in fucking prison. If they can do it, you have no excuse. And this is why so many of you got pissed off at me during the COVIDs because I didn't give a shit. I cared, but I didn't care. I felt bad for you that you had to choose between getting the clot shot or keeping your job. I did feel bad for you. I did think it was wrong. But for me personally and for my family, I did not care. Did not care at all, period, because who's going to fire me? And I don't say that to be arrogant. I say it because I want it for you. I want you to have it. If you can get through just the first three chains and cut them, these are all easy ones compared to the rest. They're hard, but they're easy. And what I mean by easy is there is literally no impediment to making these three things happen. The physical, emotional severance is up to you. It is a decision. That if you truly make it, if you don't just say the words, remember, go back to religion. If you're a Christian and you accept the sacrifice, blah, 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 and you accept forgiveness and it's a done deal if you mean it. But if you don't mean it, it's not. That's how the emotional and mental thing is. It may pull at you again. It may tempt you again. But if you mean it when you say it, it's done. So that's something you can do right now, this moment, if you choose to. You'll fight it, but it's still done. The financial exit, that's just a matter of having discipline with your money and working harder to make more of it and working hard at spending less of it.
That's all that is. The entrepreneurial path is what is going to naturally occur if you do the first two. That's why I put these three first. If you develop mental and emotional sovereignty and you take command of your finances, you're going to build a business because what's going to happen is you're going to look at your employment income and go, I give these motherfuckers way too much of my money. And the ability to do something about it is inherently limited. You can make 200000 a year on your paycheck and you are going to pay a hell of a lot more in taxes than I do. And I won't say what my gross income is, but it's higher than that. Okay? And I'm going to pay less tax than you because I'm an entrepreneur. And that alone is a reason to move my income out of employment and into business owner or at least self-employment. Making my own decisions and giving the bastards that steal from me less of my money completely legally by their own rule book. So you do one in two, three happens. Now let's move on to things that are more about what you got to do mechanically. You need to exit the education and information system. And I want you to understand how entwined they are. I put them as one thing because they're literally wrapped around each other like the snakes on the, on the, on the staff in, 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 the, in the medicine staff, right? They are, they are wrapped around each other. The information and education chain is one chain. It's like E and I, E and I in each link, and it wraps around you, and it is one of the most controlling. And it's what leads to number one, emotional, spiritual, and mental control. So number one, if you have kids, you need to act like the school that they go to is a burning building full of carcinogenic things with smoke that every day they're there, if they don't burn to death, they're inhaling carcinogens. You need to see it as that inherently evil. And the reason you need to see that is they won't have to do this shit when they're your age. They won't have to break this conditioning because you're going to get them out of it before they ever go through it. Because if you look at it that way, you're going to turn your mental computer on. And you're going to go, shit, I got to get my kids out of the system. And instead of telling me, but I can't, you're going to say, how can I? You're going to get an answer. Take your kids away from the beast. They do not deserve they do not have the right to, they do not deserve the honor and the privilege of influencing the minds of your children. For God's sakes, folks, in the words of Malcolm X, long gone, fortunately his words are not, only a fool, another word for fool is fucking idiot, okay, phrase, only an idiot would let his enemy educate his children, and I'll add to it, and then be shocked when his child grows up to hate him and what he stands for. I have people in my family right now. I have a, a nephew and a brother-in-law, and they have knocked down, drag out fights over this liberal conservative bullshit. The young man went off to college. He was a typical conservative young man, grew up in the freaking Methodist church. Now he's on and on about white privilege. He's one of the most privileged white kids I know in my life, but he's talking about white privilege and all the other freaking gobbledygook bullshit that goes along with it. Well. I feel bad for my brother-in-law, but he sent his child to Caesar to be educated, and now he is shocked that his child has become a Roman. So get them out. You, as a grown-ass man or woman, went through that. Don't blame your mom and dad. Don't blame your grandparents. They didn't know no better. You're the one that has to now fix it for yourself. You have to re-educate yourself to the realities in the world. And the first place, and this is why they go together, the first thing you need to do to make that happen, you need to shut off their information funnel. If you're watching Fox News every night, you cannot un, you cannot unplug. You're, you're the alcoholic. You're not ready to go to the bar yet with your friends and not drink. You tell a guy, guy says, well, I've been drinking my whole life, but my friends are down at Billy Bob's bar. So I'm going to stop drinking today, but I'm going to go Billy Bob's tonight. What are the odds that dude's going to drink and drink his ass off tonight? He's going to have, well, you know what? I really completely, I just have one. And we all know where that goes next, right? If you came out of the, the, the modern education system and re received your indoctrination, you cannot handle listening to CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, any of that shit. You need a major fast period not going to the bar. You need to separate yourself from people that drink and not drink for six months before you even get near where you can smell it or you have no hope. Any rehab person will tell you the same thing. 
And there are people that can break that rule. There are people that can decide one day I'm not going to drink. They can go to a wedding the next day and everybody's just jacked up out of their minds and never touch it again. That's a unicorn. You're probably not one. You're probably not one. Break the information flow and find other ways to obtain information. You need to find things like podcasts, real alternative media, not a website with a different name repackaging the same bullshit. And if you don't do that, you're screwed. You need to learn to figure out, first of all, what do I even need to know? Do you need to know that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell? Right? Is the quote an old, you know, an old thing that people talk about what they learned in school? Do you? Are you going to go into biology at that level? Then maybe you need to know. But what, what do you want to do will dictate what you need to know. And here's the thing. Humans learn what we need to know when we need to know it. And humans learn what we're interested in when we become interested in it. And you can't stop a person who can read and write and, and, and basically do the trivium, which is I can read and write and understand, and I can communicate in reading and writing. And I can use rhetoric to actually explain my position, bounce it off of other people and hear their opinion on it. And I can use logic to rectify the two back together. If I can do that, there's literally nothing that if I actually want to know how to do it, unless I have brain damage or something or an IQ of 47, that you can prevent me from knowing. This is why you need to be empowered with educating your children. The most powerful words ever uttered to me about the education of children came from Mike and Sula Pries. And I don't remember which one of them said it, but they used to be our homeschool couple on the expert council. And when we were doing this, I was all in. I'm ready. My wife was hesitant. And so we had a conference with them. I'm like, they've done this with generation after generation of kids. They raise kids up and they adopt more and do it again. They are literally experts in this because they've done it more times than most people ever will. And I think it was Sue told Dorothy, you cannot prevent a child from learning a thing that they wish to learn. And you cannot force a child to learn a thing that they refuse to learn. And I said, well, shit, that applies to all of us. So you can stop worrying about not being able to learn a thing. You can start worrying about learning the things that you want to learn and you need to learn. And you just change your whole world. And that's a chain. See, a lot of these chains, we can break the link and we're still going to, we don't need their shit at all. You don't need them at all. Everything you want to learn, there's a resource with how to learn it, or there's a person you can pay to teach you it. And if you're not willing to pay for it, you don't really want to learn it. Take that approach. And again, if you take the first one, the emotional and mental freedom, see, I said there wasn't a reason for the order, but there was. It's not an importance. It's what leads to what. And you financially exit, you're going to become an entrepreneur. And the only way you're going to be successful as an entrepreneur is to learn self-learning. And as soon as you do that and you harness that, you're going to be like, I'm going to be damned if somebody's going to steal this shit from my kids. If it takes you to 40 to figure this shit out, you're going to be like, I'm going to give my kids a start at 20, not 40. This is not happening for them. I'm not going to worry about, well, they need to know this. If they need to know something, they'll figure it out. They'll learn it. We learn what we need to know when we need to know it. And it's never been a case in humanity's time that that wasn't the case. But today we have more resources to do that ad hoc, at will, when we choose to than we've ever had in history. There's never been a time where it's easier to know zero about a thing other than the fact that it exists and say, I want to know more about it, how to do it, how to implement it in my life. And a week later, if you put effort into it, know more about it than 90% of people that claim to know about it. So stop stressing. Just turn off the fucking news. You don't need it. So if, if a princess dies in a tunnel within 37 seconds, just between email and social media, even alternative social media, which is much better, you'll know it. Somebody will tell you, and you can decide if you're interested in it or not. You won't miss a thing. It'll be okay. Turn the damn TV off. Use it for entertainment only. And be very careful that the entertainment is not doing mental programming. There's a reason they call it programming. Next, the physical exit. I think if you do these things, you're going to have enough financial horsepower and enough mental horsepower and you'll been through problem solving enough times that you'll say, if you don't want to physically live where you do, it will be really easy to move somewhere else and improve your physical surroundings. 
I live exactly where I want to live. I know I bitch about the rock on my property sometimes. Guys, I don't really bitch about it. I just tell you someone, somebody says, well, why don't you just do this so that I don't have to answer that question? Because it physically does not work here. I have other ways. I've adapted. I love this place. I love having workshops with 90 people on this property. I love that I can do that. And no one can say shit about it. I love my ducks. I love my ponds. I love having my grandkids just be able to go out the door and run. I love if they go out front, I just send the dog with them. And I think, man, you try to get in that front gate and bother those kids with that dog out there. You're not getting in. And if you do get in, your first question is going to be, how the fuck do I get out of here? I love that. I chose to live here. There was absolutely no one that could prevent us from coming here to this place when we decided to do it. And there are so many things that do not apply to me that apply to people that live a couple miles down the road. And people say, well, what would you do if they annexed you? Well, first, I'll fight it. Second, if I have to, you bet I'll leave. I will physically relocate. I will change my circumstances if I have to. I will sell. I will pretty some things up, change some things, put out good marketing, sell this property to some stupid yuppie that wants to live inside city limits, and I'll move further out. You'd really abandon everything? You're damn right I would. Because my freedom's worth more than a piece of dirt. But I need to have a job. Why do you think we already put the entrepreneurship ahead of that? If you employ you, you can work from wherever you choose to. Right? See how simple that is? I'll tell you what. When we have these workshops I talk about all the time, on any given one of them, there's a dozen people or more here that are multimillionaires. Almost, I can think of one exception, almost every one of them is an entrepreneur. And they all live wherever the hell they want to live. But we'll also have a bunch of people that they have to really think about whether they're going to come to a workshop for 600 bucks and take that much time and be here. And they still live where they want to live. I remember a friend of mine a long, long time ago told me how he wanted to live. This guy was in information technology. He could work on site or if he really wanted to, he could work remotely. He could work just about anywhere that he wanted to work. And thanks, Mike, for the $10 super chat. I really appreciate that. I'll leave that up there for a minute. Um, and he described to me one day how he wanted to live. He said, I just, I just want to place to live like, I don't care if it's a mobile home. I don't give a damn. And I want a few acres and I want to be near woods and I want to be able to hunt and fish and have a garden. And I said, Brad, you just described the way literally millions of broke ass rednecks in this country live. And you're not a broke ass redneck. You're like me, you're a redneck, but you're not a broke ass redneck. So if they can do it, why can't you do it? He, he had five seconds of awakening where he said, well, that's, that's a good point. And then immediately when he was forced with the reality that it was a choice, he shut down. He shut down. And he decided that, no, we can't go down this path because this would put it all on me. If you want to physically exit the place you're in, the only person preventing you from doing it is you. And when you say, but my family or whatever, I'll bet you there's a way to make both sides happy. It doesn't mean that we have to move across the country or the world. Sometimes 10 miles down the road is all that it takes. So the physical exit, you can only decide. And thanks to Jonathan for the super chat as well. You can only decide where, when, and how to make that physical exit. But you're also the only person that can prevent it. You're the only one. No one else is responsible for you being stuck in a place other than you. You can make that decision for yourself. Again, thanks, Jonathan. Then the food system exit. You know, I'm going to say, start out, grow a damn garden. Grow a garden. Yeah, I'm not going to give you every step in these. I'm going to tell you the ones that are. You figure out what to do with them. Your mind's that powerful. You are super powered being. You know, I'm going to segue here just for a second. Bonnie, thank you for the $49.99 super chat. Thank you so much. Um, I just had a chat with my granddaughter. 
she was really mad because grandma was making her sound out words while she was reading a book. And she was well, basically kid's book, 10 words on a page, make her sound out one word for every page and otherwise read to her. She's five. She didn't want to do it. She threw a fit. Kids throw fits sometimes. It's okay. She went in the bedroom, slammed the door like only a woman can do, even a young one. Threw a fit, started yelling and shouting. I walked in. No! Didn't get upset. Sat down next to her and said, hey, Tegan, let me tell you a secret. Do you want a superpower? She said, what? Starts drying her eyes. I said, do you want to have a superpower? Well, yeah. I said, you know who has a superpower? Papa has a superpower. Grandma has a superpower. Mommy and daddy had a superpower. Even brother has a superpower. Do you want the superpower too? She said, yeah. I said, reading is a superpower. Once you know how to read, no one can ever lie to you again and get away with it unless you let them. If you want to know something, no one can ever stop you from knowing it. If you want to travel somewhere in your head, no one can ever prevent you from going there. You can find out anything. You can know anything. You can tell if somebody's telling the truth or a lie for anything once you learn how to read. And we talked a little longer and it went on, but she ended up running out to my wife and throwing her arms around her neck and telling her she was sorry and said, I want to read a book. I want to read a book. And my wife said, what did you tell her? And I just told her the truth. Oh, you're waiting for what the truth is? No, that's what I said. I told her the truth. I told her the truth about reading, that it's a superpower. That one of the greatest ways that humanity was controlled for the longest period of time. And yes, I did this, explain it to this little girl, five years of age at this level. It was one of the biggest ways people were controlled because they didn't know how to read. So you could tell them whatever you wanted to tell them. And if you were in power, if you were someone special, they had to believe you. They couldn't check. But once people learned how to read, they took a big step toward freedom. Works the same way with you guys. It's the same thing. Knowing that you're responsible for your decisions and realizing that you can change them anytime you want to. It's fucking superpower, guys. It really is. It's superpower. It's why you look at certain people and think they have the touch. They have magic. No, they have a superpower. The thing about a superpower is a real superpower. Not some bullshit in the comic books where somebody got irradiated up the butt by a freaking green, uh, a green glowing capsule that popped out of a nuclear plant or something. Or ate a three-eyed fish or whatever. Got bit by a radioactive spider. Not fake, real superpowers. They're universally accessible to anybody that will do the work to acquire them. The knowledge that you are responsible alone for what happens to you and what you do about it takes work. It's simple because it's easy to understand, but it's not easy because it's hard to do. If it's a superpower, it is good that it takes effort to acquire, least it be abused, least it be wasted. At least it'd be squandered. So if you work for the understanding that simply by asking the question, how can I change my physical location for the better? That you know that once you put that problem in your brain and you really give it your attention in time, the computer will work out a solution. It will work out multiple solutions. And it's only up to you to pick the one that is the most executable for your wants and needs. If you work for it, you won't waste it. You already have that power. Your brain, if you're listening to this and you can understand my words, you have the intellectual capacity to do this already. But if you're not doing it, you're squandering it. You're wasting your superpower. Now, if I have to explain that to a five-year-old, I get it. But when I have to explain that to grown-ass men and women in this country, and I do, I don't blame you. I'm not going to pick on you for it. I bet you thought I was going to. No. I blame these systems, and that's why we're talking about disconnecting from them today. Next, the water and sanitation exit. It's a pretty easy one, but it's something people don't really think about. Imagine a world where the government decides they don't want you doing what you're doing. And one way that they can gain control over you is to turn a knob somewhere and there's no water to your house anymore. 
Now, you might think I've moved off into the world of space bat, moon bat, conspiracy theory. But did we not just go through a period of time where businesses were ordered to close by local governments, specifically in places like New York, New Jersey, and California, and Washington? And business owners said, these nuts and good for them. And I'm going to leave my business open. And they shut their electricity off. Is it so hard to believe that your water could be shut off if they can shut off somebody's power because they didn't close their business? Really? If so, you're not paying attention. So you need to think about where your water comes from and how you manage your sanitation. Where does your garbage go every week? What goes in your garbage? How did it get there? What goes in garbage that could become a resource so we can go back and grow our own food through composting? Well, that shit shouldn't go in the garbage, should it? What goes in your garbage that's waste material from things you buy that you could buy without the waste material along the way? Or how can you reduce that waste material or repurpose that waste material so you don't rely on sanitation? Where's poop go? Be blunt. Where's mine go? It goes in a septic tank. I can figure out how to get that bitch pumped once every five years. I don't care. The, the world can literally end. Puppy kittens are falling out of the sky. Dogs and cats are having marital relationships with each other. And I'll figure out how to get that thing pumped once every five years. They can't shut me off. I got a well. I got a well and a generator and a lot of self-reliance that go along with it. And eventually we will get to a point where we are more off grid and I will figure out how to get the water out of the ground with the well. I've also got 3,000 gallons of water catch. I've got a 26,000 gallon above ground pool and I've got ponds out the butt. And I know where local surface water is and I know how a pump that runs on DC works and I know that I can take a tarp put it in the back of a pickup truck and go get 100 gallons of water anytime I want with the residual energy from the battery in my pickup truck. You see how that works? And I'm not even getting started yet. You don't have to do a lot here, but you at least need to think about it. What would you do if you couldn't flush the toilet? And what would you do if you turned the faucet on and the water didn't come out of it? This is an interesting thing. It happens with power, too. So if you've never had it happen with your water, think about how it happens with power. And it will tell you how dependent you become on their systems. Have you ever had a situation where your water was shut off? And you knew it was shut off. It had been a day. And you get something on your hands or you grab a glass, you're going to take a pill or something. And even though the water's off, you walk up to the sink, turn it on, and then you're like, oh, yeah, shit. Or have you ever been in a situation where the power's off? You ain't got a generator running or anything yet. Maybe you do. And you got some of the power in the house going. And you walk into a room and you ain't got your little backup lantern hanging from the roof in there like you should. And you go, click. And how many times does it happen? Dude goes, click. And it should be immediate. Oh, yeah, power's out. No, they click, 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 click. Oh, oh, yeah. Right? And that tells you how dependent we are on their systems for power, for water, and for sanitation. And we really need to do something about it. We really need to take that step. And the next one is energy. And at minimum, I think every single American, every single person, but I, I talk mostly to Americans because I live here in America. And if you're, oh, you're in a different country, thank you for listening. I don't, I don't mean it negatively. But guys, everybody should have at least a generator to run their basic needs for energy and enough fuel to run that generator for at least 15 days, half a month. That's not that hard to do. And if we had that, what we wouldn't have when there's a freaking power outage or a hurricane or something like that is people in literal freaking knife fights in line at the gas station. And I'm not making it up. Like, this has happened. Or pictures of some moron with a shopping bag putting gasoline in it not understanding you ain't going to make it home before that thing gets a hole in it from the solvent nature of the gas. Have y'all seen it? anybody that saw that happen at some time when it, during one of these outages? Some fool with like a Walmart bag or some shit putting gasoline in it. Say me in the in the chat. I know there was a lot of that shit in one of the last hurricanes, right? So you need to have some plan for your energy. Going off grid's great. I think it's where we need to head all of us as expediently as we can but at least up that self-reliance quotient there. Because you know what a lot of those business owners I mentioned earlier did, right? When they turned off their power, it's like, I know where Lowe's is. You shut down all the stores. You didn't shut down Lowe's. 
They went down to Lowe's, bought themselves like a Generac or a Troy built 10,000 well, you know, watt generator, put some gas in it, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> turned shit on, turned the freaking neon light on in the window and opened up and said, bitch, I ain't shutting down. We need to all be like that. And I want you to think about this. What if when they shut that business down, a whole bunch of people like us walked up and said, I put my name on it. I want it back. Here's five gallons. Here's five gallons. Right? And if they find you, here's 10 bucks. And that's all you did, but there was a thousand of you. Guess what? That's called being unfucking governable. That's what that's about. That's what I'm trying to teach you today. And being ungovernable is not just about individually being ungovernable. It's when you recognize your own saying, well, I've got preparations made. I'm doing really well during all this crap. This one didn't hit me because of my situation and my structure. That person's like me, but their place they chose to carve out a niche is one that's being hit. I think I'll just take a little bit of what I have and I'll go over there and I'll give it to them. And I'm going to call up everybody in my network and let them know about this. And instead of sending them money through the banking system that can be seized by the government, you just walk down there and hand them a couple bills and a can of gas or a, a, a crate of food or whatever it is you have to give or a tub of water or whatever it is. But you know, it's a restaurant and they're having trouble. And you say, you do serve breakfast? Yeah, here's four dozen duck eggs. That should get you through tomorrow. I can't get you through the week, but I can get you through tomorrow. I'll make some phone calls. You know what this is? I've talked about certain movies on and off through the show over the years. There's a scene in Tombstone, one of my favorite movies, movies the one with Val Kilmer and Kurt Russell and all in it. And it's right after the gunfight at the OK Corral. And Sheriff Behan walks up to Wyatt and he says, you're all under arrest. And Wyatt just looks at him and says, I don't think I'm going to let you arrest us today, Behan. Thanks, Phil. I appreciate the super chat for 20 bucks. Really, thank you a lot. Um, I'm not going to let you arrest us today, Behan. And what I've talked about is building community to the point where when they go to tear out somebody's front yard garden or some stupid shit, which has happened over the years, that when they get there to do the deed, there's 400 neighbors standing in front of that house going, I, I don't... I don't think we're going to let you do this today. See, when you become self-sufficient and self-reliant this way, when you untether from the system, you're dangerous. Not just because they can't control you, because you can control to redirect your surplus reserves whenever you want to, to somebody that's on your side when you're not the one in the sights of the gun. You just go, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to ask some other people to help. And it's amazing what happens when somebody sets an example. I don't mention the super chats very often because I don't want to look like I'm a grifter asking for your money or nothing. But it's interesting to me that every time somebody does it, four or five other people do it. Let's channel that a different way. What do you think would happen if somebody opened their business during one of these damn shutdowns and one guy waddles his butt down there, says, here's my generator. I don't need it right now. This is my backup generator. I got two of them. Two is one, one is none. Unless my, I just want you to understand if, if the one I have fails, okay, I'm going to have to come take it back. But as long as the one I have is working and I don't need it, you can keep this until this is over. Here's 10, here's 10 gallons of gas. Here's 25 bucks and put a picture on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, wherever, and said, hey, look what I just did for this person that's standing up for our rights. By the way, if you can't give, Go do business with them. Go buy from them. Ungovernable. I don't think I'm going to let you do this today, agent of the state. I don't think I'm going to allow it. I don't think I'm going to permit it. There was even a beach, and of all places, California, that they shut down, and all the people just kept going there. And the local mayor or whatever it was said, we've decided we're not going to have these rules anymore because these people don't want to be governed this way anymore. And I thought, holy shit. People are waking up. No. And only that one little group of people in that one little place on that one little beach figured it out. What if everybody had done that all at the same time two years ago? We would have went through half of this shit. You know why they didn't do it? Because they don't know the shit I'm telling you today. That's why. Because they haven't done these things. 
They're still wrapped up in the mental, emotional control system. They still have that chain wrapped around their heart because that emotional and mental sovereignty slavery chain, that chain goes right inside your chest. It's not the matrix plugged into the back of your neck. It goes right in through your breast milk and it wraps like a python around your heart and a big lock goes on it, goes multiple different ways. So your heart can just barely beat inside that chain. You don't have that. You don't have any of the rest of this. You have that. You're going to end up having the rest of this. You're going to do it. You're going to make it happen. Right. And then we've got the healthcare exit. If you do not have a direct primary care physician, you should probably start interviewing doctors for the job. We did an episode. I'll try to add it to the show notes if I don't forget about direct primary care. About two months ago, we had a doctor on that is a, a direct primary care physician. These are doctors. You pay them a small monthly fee and they do anything you need for done at all. If you need lab work, you get it done for cash. Instead of putting it on your insurance, you get it done for a fraction of the cost. And their primary job is to keep you healthy and keep you out of the ER. And if you end up in the hospital, be a patient advocate for you. It's not that expensive. It's not that expensive. It's not that expensive. You can afford it. If you can't afford it, figure out how you can afford it and have one. Period. End of story. Get on a good diet. My advice, keto, carnivore, ketovore, anything that cuts your carbohydrates down to almost nothing. Or at least, for God's sakes, get your total, not net, total carbohydrates under 100 grams a day. That's not even hard. But I think you should be down more toward... 20 or less a day, carbohydrates. This is the result. Go look at some pictures of me from five years ago, and you go, who the hell is that fat guy? I mean, really. There's a reason we have dialysis clinics popping up faster than subway restaurants today in big cities. And it's one thing. It's obesity. Kidneys going bad and type 2 diabetes due to obesity go hand in hand like peanut butter and jelly, period. Get your diet right. Eat right. Take care of yourself. If you're abusing substances, I don't care if it's alcohol, drugs, I don't care. Stop abusing them. If you can't use them responsibly, stop using them. Period. 90% of your need of the health system will go away. You should still have health insurance. Because let me tell you what, like talk about using the system where it's where it makes sense. You know what our medical system's really good at? When you get in a car wreck. And you have a piece of metal going through your abdomen into your spleen and you need your life saved. We have surgeons that can save your life in the, in the systems. They're very good at what they do. They're not all perfect, but overall, they're very good at what they do. If, some, if you didn't take care of yourself and you need a valve put in your heart, we have surgeons that can crack your chest open and put a valve in your heart. Or even give you somebody else's heart or kidneys or liver. Best thing to do, stay off that table, don't end up there. But even if you live a perfectly healthy life, you can get a cancer, you can have an accident. So there's a place for their system. But the first rule of business is keep your body healthy. Keep your body healthy. Number one reason that people that got the COVID died, number one comorbidity other than age, because there's, we'll get to that in a second. But number one comorbidity was obesity. And the thing is, we say, well, that person had multiple comorbidities. How many of them are because of obesity? Let's be honest. Let's stop this bullshit about healthy at any size. If you are fucking fat, you are not healthy. I'm sorry. If that hurts your feelings, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you feel bad, but I hope feeling bad makes you decide to feel good. I lost almost 100 pounds. I never went hungry once. I was never hungry. There, maybe, maybe that's a lie. I don't want to lie to y'all. Maybe in the very, very beginning, there were times where I felt a little bit hungry. But overall, I was never starving. And if I was really hungry, I ate. Just thought about what I ate. You know, I threw a bunch of meat with no sugar at all in the refrigerator, cold. If you're really hungry, go eat some of it. If you're over your calories for the day, if you're even you're adding calorie restriction because you're trying to correct something, okay, fine. You're over that day. Go eat meat. Oh, you don't want meat? You're not that hungry. You're not that hungry then. But I, I feel hungry. Then here's a piece of steak. You don't want to eat it? Well, it's cold and leftover. You don't want to eat it? No, then you're not hungry. You think you're hungry. You win that mental battle, and the health comes into alignment. 
There's people now tell me you look 10 years younger than you did five years ago. Thank you. But it's just nutrition. And that's the number one thing you can do for your health is nutrition with a good doctor that operates outside the system. It is impossible. No matter how well-intentioned your doctor is, if they accept insurance for them to do their best for you, I'm not going to go into it. Maybe I'll do a whole show on that. Maybe I should bring Ken Berry on just instead of talking about keto, like we've always done when Ken's on. I'm going to reach out to Ken. I'm going to say, I want Ken, I want you to come on and I want you to tell people while your general practitioner doctor cannot do their job, no matter how good their intentions are, if they work in the insurance system and let him explain it to you. I'm just telling you, it can't be done. It can't be done. Not unless you want to either end up losing your license and or going bankrupt as a physician. You can't do it. It's impossible. The system is designed. Here's the basics of it. And we'll let's see if Ken will come on. Your doctor is able to bill for more money every time he sees you based on how many prescriptions you have. I can bill more money if you're on two prescriptions versus zero. And I can bill more money if you're on five versus two. And the sweet spot's either four or five where I can bill the maximum. And if I want to make my Lexus payments and send my son to Harvard Business School and do the shit my wife wants done and join the country club, I'm going to follow the system, even if I'm well-intentioned. And if I try to fight following the system, I'll get nothing but misery and failure and potential repercussions, like losing my license. That's what's going to happen. So you got to get out of that system. That system is for catastrophic injury and catastrophic disease. That's what it's for. Everything else needs to be outside of that system. Here's an example of it. It doesn't even have to be on an ongoing basis. I would highly suggest that you look around where you live right now and find out if there's a hydration company. The kind of thing where people like they know they're going to get tore up at a bridal shower or a bachelor's uh, thing or a wedding. And they have people come out and give them IV fluids before it and or after it, like that kind of company. There's companies that do it for those reasons. In fact, they all do it for those reasons. They also do it where they, they do it routinely as a health boosting thing with certain uh, vitamins and nutrients and minerals. And there's and they do it when somebody's sick, like they have the flu or a cold or the COVIDs. When my wife got COVID last year, she became extremely dehydrated. And getting hydration at the ER with COVID was almost impossible. And I had this backed up by an EMT. Actually, it was a paramedic. So one level above an EMT who wrote into me and said, you're absolutely right. I had to go to the ER. I worked out of three times before they'd give me IV fluids because he was dehydrated from COVID. And there's a lot of situations where people become ill and their major problem, especially as we get older, is dehydration because we, we can't drink through the sore throat or whatever. And so when that happened to her, we paid 300 bucks. And in 30 minutes, there was a man here gave her a liter and a half of fluids and a course of, of vitamins and minerals and nutrients. And she was in a, she was not having trouble breathing or anything, but she was really miserable. 30 minutes after that man left, she fell asleep and she slept like a rock for 10 hours. And there was nothing but up after that. And we would have never gotten that done at an ER. That's personal responsibility for your health. Now, you know, so now you have no Freaking excuse to not, as soon as this is over, find a company like that, put them on some in your database or speed dial or whatever. So, you know, if you need them, they're there. Maybe call them up and find out what their policy, what their response time and stuff like that is. Because it's something that you can do. You can do it instantly. And, and we even told them, hey, we've both got COVID. And the guy, they said, we'll charge you extra 25 bucks. Guy came in, put a mask on. He said, I don't give a shit. They make me do it. Because I worked in the ER the entire time that this first started. I, I'm sure I've had it multiple times or whatever. I'm not afraid of it, but they make me do it. And then he didn't even charge us the 25 bucks. He's like, I fill out the invoice. Now, how does that beat sitting in the ER for four hours to be told no, that, that, that fluids is not a treatment for COVID? You know what fluid is a treatment for, stupid? Dehydration. But they have protocols they have to follow. And you cannot expect people in the system to break the system's rules. So I went longer on that one than I wanted. The last one, though, is the self and property protection system, your police department, right? I got to tell you, the local sheriff's deputies for Tar Tarrant County that patrol my area 
are some of the best men and women I've ever met. They, I don't ever see them causing anybody trouble. I don't ever see them harassing people. Now, I, 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 I will immediately stip, you know, stipulate that I believe if they were called upon to do a thing that they really didn't want to do, they'll probably do it anyway. But in their general practice of work, they don't bother people. They don't run speed traps. They're not pulling people over because their turn signal didn't work. And if they did, one guy I know that it happened to around here, a guy just said, hey, I wanted you to know your turn signal's not working. So please take care of that. Didn't even do a written warning and sent him on his way. Just wanted you to know so you don't get smacked. Use hand signals until you get it fixed. They're about as good as they get. They're still about 10 minutes away when I have a problem that'll kill me in 30. So I have a dog that'll eat your face off. I have a gun that'll blow your face off. And my family is and their life and their safety is worth more than you if you choose to threaten it. And I'm trained and I know how to do it. And if you want a dog that's trained in advance to do it, I should point that out. Yeah, I'm wearing Joel Ryle's shirt today that he gave me at the workshop this, this February, Fortress K9. You can buy yourself a pre-weaponized dog if you want to, or you can train your own like I did. It's all up to you. It's all up to you. But you better take responsibility for your safety, your personal protection, and the protection of your property. Start by not advertising the shit you have to people that walk down the road. You want a basic formula? For a very safe and secure property, put a fence all the way around it. Where I live, I can't do that. Then move. Like I said earlier, that's a different one. That's, we already hit that chain. The minute you put a fence around your property, front and backyard, all the way around, you don't even have to train a dog very much. You get a dog big enough to bite somebody, and you put them in that fence, and somebody tries to come over that fence because you locked the gate. The natural instinct of the dog is, this bitch does not belong in here. I'm going to bite him. And that dog's out in that yard. People don't like getting bit. I'm not saying it's a fortress, okay? I'm not saying no one will ever do it. I'm saying the odds it's going to happen just went down. Then don't make it look attractive. Don't make it look like if I get in, there's a big win for me. Then put up a sign. Someone says something like, you're not trespass. You're not lost. You're trespassing. Not no trespassing. You hear what I said there? You're not lost. You're trespassing. Let's take that excuse away. I was lost. In trying, no, no, you weren't. Put a sign on the gate with your cell phone number on it. We have one. It says, do not enter this property. Dogs protect it. Call this number. So if somebody has broke down on the road and needs my assistance or the police need me or anybody needs me, we are a phone call away. Every excuse you have for coming on my property is now gone. And guess what? As long as the person can read English, they know what it says, and you get that little sinking feeling in your gut. And make it look like you're a redneck a little bit. Rednecks have guns. Rednecks shoot people. Everybody knows this. Now, I'm not saying this is 100% of the formula. <clears throat> I'm saying this is a part of a formula that's very effective even by itself. <clears throat> We've had exactly zero trespassers on this property. Because what I just gave you. The other side of it, though, is one of my laws of life, and I can't remember the uh, personal defense trainer that, that uses this term, very well-known person. I heard it through Frank Sharp Jr. from uh, Fortress Defense Consultants, and he heard it from this guy. And some of y'all probably know and tell me who it was that originally said it. Don't go to stupid places and do stupid things with stupid people. There's your first rule of self-defense, and 90% of your potential problems will go away. If you look at a place and think, I shouldn't be here, you're probably right. Don't go there. If you're with somebody and think, this fool and me should not be together, you're probably right. Get away from the fool. See how simple that is? And a lot of things go away. A lot of problems go away. And if you're thinking, this action I'm about to take seems kind of stupid. Maybe I shouldn't do it. Trust yourself. It's probably dumber than you think it is if you even had that thought. Become situationally aware. We play this game all the time with the kids. When we drive home, tell me three things. Driving through a place we go all the time. Tell me three things you noticed that you didn't notice before. And I'll tell you if I noticed them. Just get in the habit of paying attention. There's a garbage bag laying on the side of the road. I'm not worried about that just because I hate it. Like, I just I observe something. I observed something. That thing wasn't there before. The tree branch on that tree broke and fell over, and it's not dropped yet. 
good to know as a road hazard, but it's also like that means I knew that it wasn't broke yesterday or last week when I drove through there. The neighbor got a new car. Never seen that car before. Maybe it's a visitor or a new car. I don't know. Go back a few more times. That car's not there. It must have been a visitor. It's not because I'm mosey. I want to notice what's going on. I go to get gas. First thing I look at is every other person in that parking lot. Are they looking at me and how are they looking at me? Don't look at me the wrong way. I might look back. Right? And if it looks like a really bad situation, there's another gas station down the road. I'm not doing a stupid thing in a stupid place with a stupid person. I'm going to go somewhere else. You're going in the store because it's one of those places where you got to pay before you can pump. They don't have a thing to put your credit card in. Don't take your damn wallet out on the way to the store. And don't be putting your wallet back in your pocket on your way out the door, neither. Okay? If you're paying in cash, cash needs to come out of your pocket, pay the guy. You're going to pay in cash, you know how much you're going to buy. Have that amount of cash in a pocket separate from the rest of your cash. Just basic daggone common sense. Teach your kids, not just stranger danger, but the stuff I'm talking about right now. Teach your kids, if you're in trouble, this is what you do. This is who you call. Have a damn code word for your kids. People can find out all kinds of shit. Hey, Jimmy, I just talked to your dad and your dog Spot just got hurt and he wants me to bring you to him. Very convincing to a five-year-old. What happens when that five-year-old said, what's the code word? Your dad didn't have time to give it to me. Tell that kid to start screaming and yelling and pointing. And if it's a mistake, we'll work it out. It'll get worked out. If it's a real mistake, that guy's going to be reasonable when people start going, hey, dude, what's going on? And if he's not reasonable, he's probably going to get his ass beat by a mob. Because when a little kid points at a guy and says, he's trying to take me, you tell me what happens. This is basic, simple stuff. And we don't do it because we rely on the sheriff and the local police department, et cetera. You know all these places where they defunded the police and crime went through the roof? Let me tell you something. If what I'm giving you in this segment was part of our schooling, it wouldn't happen, would it? Would it? If the average result of stealing from somebody or trying to hurt somebody, et cetera, was getting your ass beat or worse, if that happened more than it didn't, if when you tried to rob a neighbor's house, not a, not only did the neighbor whoop your ass, but the neighbor tied into a local network of people and four or five people beat your ass and threw you over the fence after you got bit by the dog, you think the crime rate might go down? And if that sounds too violent for you, maybe you shouldn't have broke into my neighbor's house. Maybe you shouldn't have pissed the dog off. Maybe you should have read the sign. Maybe you shouldn't have took something that wasn't yours. Maybe there wouldn't be a bite in one ass cheek and a bullet in the other if you didn't do that shit. You know the most polite place that I've ever been in my life? A freaking gun range. Isn't everybody polite at the gun range? Hey, can we go down range and check our targets? Yeah, that's right. Everybody puts their gun down. And everybody's nice. Nobody mouths anybody. I've never seen anybody mouth anybody off at a gun range in my life. An armed society is a polite society. If you're not an armed citizen, you need to become one. And yes, you need the training to go along with it. That's it. That's what I got for you today. I am going to take a few questions, uh, but since I'm going to start doing the whole show, not just the, uh, the video segment on, on air today, I want to talk to you guys today about um, our item of the day. And I want to remind you guys, one of the ways you can support me and the work that I do, if you like what you heard today, is just do your online shopping at tspaz.com. That's T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. If you do your online shopping at tspaz, You'll help us out no matter what you buy. And what will happen is this little tab right here at the top of the website where it says TSPAZ. You'll just get redirected there, and you can see all the stuff that I've reviewed. Today's item of the day, if you are concerned about food security, and you should be after today, is a book called Perennial Vegetables by Eric Tosenmeyer. I love Eric and his work. He co-wrote Edible Forest Gardens with Dave Jackie, which is probably the greatest treats he ever written on edible plants. Uh, he also wrote a book called Paradise Lot. Uh, with Jonathan Bates, I think was, was the guy he co-wrote that book with, which is a great book into itself. I really need to add it to the uh, T-SPAS uh, catalog. 
But this book, Perennial Vegetables, is pretty much all the high quality food plants that you can grow that are either perennials, meaning they come back every year, or they're so big on self reseeding and self propagating, they might as well be perennial, even though they might have an annual life cycle. It's an expensive book, but it's on sale for 18% off today. You can just go to the survivalpodcast.com right now during the live stream. It'll be the top post there. Anytime today, it'll probably be just under the podcast that you're hearing right now. But you can always help us out just by doing your online shopping at tspaz.com. This is what tspaz looks like for those who've never been here before. You got all of our reviews by category. Those are all alphabetized. And you can see the Amazon deals of the day just by clicking that first link. And if you start shopping there, you'll help us out no matter what you buy. And uh, we are back now live again. Uh, I appreciate you guys a lot. I do have some questions if, uh, and I'm going to handle them and uh, or comments you want me to respond to. Now would be the time. We'll try to hit a few of those before we uh, we get off air here. Uh, just use all caps in the first couple, three words. You can do that now. I'm going to start covering the ones we already have starred. And uh, again, thank you to everybody that super chatted me today. Eka Mouse says, Jack, any ideas for setting up a mushroom alcove in a high plains desert environment? Thanks. Eka Mouse, you are in the same place I am with mushrooms. How do you do mushrooms in a place where mushrooms don't do well. There are some things I miss about Pennsylvania. And one is mushroom foraging. I, I don't even know if I would worry about cultivating mushrooms if I lived where I used to live in Pennsylvania, because there's just different times of the year where different mushrooms are available and you just go into the woods and get mushrooms. And I mean, I remember Mataki, uh, which is uh, hand of the woods, ram's head, uh, call it what you want to. It's one of the most expensive mushrooms in the world. And I remember literally filling the back of a pickup truck. With, with these with these mushrooms and selling more than half of it just across the bar for $15 a pound in the 80s. All right. So it, it's hard to live in a place where you can't grow mushrooms. I've tried here the easiest mushroom that, that you supposedly can cultivate, especially outdoors, is uh, uh, King Strophoria. And uh, I'm trying one more time. And I'll tell you what I'm doing. And maybe this will work for you too, Eka Mouse or somebody else out there. So I bought some grow bags. These are the things that are kind of like a shopping bag, but they're made to grow plants in. And I filled it with wood chips. And I put a couple rocks in the bottom so it would stay underwater. And I put a layer of wood chips and a layer of strophoria spawn, and a layer of wood chips and a layer of strophoria spawn, and a layer of wood chips. And I should do a video on some of the expansion that I'm doing, including that picture I showed you at the beginning of this video, and show you exactly what it looks like. But it's just basically a bag full of wood chips is what it looks like. And I built a shelf out of cinder blocks. And I set it about four inches deep in the water in a place that 90% of the day is under shade. Those wood chips cannot dry out. If that doesn't fruit for me, I'm going to give up. You're even drier than me. That's the best. Something like that's the best advice I have. The other thing is my big giant compost piles that I've been making with the wire around them. I took one that was only half full and I did the same thing with wood chips. I did a layer of wood chips, layer of spawn, layer of wood chips, layer of spawn. I put some stuff over it to keep it in shade and I wet it down every day and we'll see how it does. So those are what I'm trying. But shade and constant moisture is really what I think you got to try. Janet says, right stinking now, no water, yay. Rain barrel for potties and water jugs for drinking, cooking, and sanitizer for our hands. So Janet had a plan for when the water didn't run. You know, and so they can't even they can't even flush the toilet. And I'll point out, if you have lots of water, you can flush toilets as long as your sewer still works. So since we have a septic tank here, what we do is we just get water from one of the ponds and you dump it in the toilet and the toilet flushes. It's like magic. You can fill the back tank up so you can push a lever. But when you push that lever in your toilet, all that happens is the water in the back tank goes into the bowl. And once the bowl goes to a certain capacity, it flushes. So you just take a five-gallon bucket and start pouring it in the bowl and it'll flush. So have a plan. Absolutely. Good on you, Janet. Uh, Bonnie says... Do you have recommend a drop off box for deliveries outside a fenced area or just renting a box at a UPS store? Either of those work. We're never not home. So we just have a sign and we have like our major deliveries come from Amazon. Like most people, that's where we get most deliveries from. We have a note rate on our account. Do not enter the fence. Put the item outside the fence. We immediately get delivery notification and one of us goes out and gets it. And that's what we do. We used to have a, a uh, like a drop box, uh, not a drop box, but like a like a PO box, but one you pay for privately. 
And it just got to be such a pain with always going down there that we stopped doing it. But it worked really well. Uh, the other thing you can do is put some sort of a locker, like a big metal box with a hasp block on it outside the property. Leave the lock unlocked and make it clear what it is. And most of your, your delivery people will put your item in it, close it, and, and lock the key if you need to do that. And that's what she means by Dropbox. Uh, we have not done that. If we were in a different situation, that's probably exactly what I would do. Thomas says, Jack quoted one of my favorite authors, an armed society is a polite society. Manners are good when one may have to back up his acts with his life. Robert A. Heinlein, Beyond the Horizon. Uh, absolutely, I agree with that. Let's see, I had six more comments come in. None of them are all caps. So well, I do have one on mushrooms. Pack Rat says, mushrooms in Azel, small cement block house, kept dark and muggy. Mushroom people at the farm. Summertown, Tennessee might have ideas. I think, yeah, you can do that. You create some sort of indoor, partially in ground, dark, humid environment. Mushrooms will grow really well in there for you. Again, I'm back to where I can't really dig a hole or I'd have it for other reasons. Um, and I'm not that desperate to grow mushrooms to build something like that for myself. But I'll tell you, I think I've got it this time with the Kingster 4. And if I can do Kingster 4, I can probably do like Oyster, Blue Oyster, King Oyster, et cetera, as well. And we'll play with that as well because I love me some mushrooms. By the way, right now, for those that saw it over the weekend, Billy Roy, Billy Roy Bob the Rooster is gone. Uh, he spurred me and, and, and shit on my grill and my bar top for the last time out in my outdoor kitchen. Uh, I had enough of them this weekend. He had many chances to reform his ways. And uh, he got processed on Sunday. And he's in a crock pot right now with some oyster mushrooms. He's basically cocovin with mushrooms since I can't do noodles like traditional cocovin. And he will be my lunch as soon as I'm done wrapping up here. Um, Hanging Laundry says, have a motion sensor at the mouth of a driveway. Absolutely. There's a lot of different options. You can use MERS radio, motion sensors, anything that tells you that somebody's there. And I'll tell you a thing that happened when I ran the motion sensors at my suburban property in, in Arlington. The dogs learned what they were in two different ways. One was when the dogs were outside, we had them in the back. So if anybody came in the backyard, they would set off. And when we heard them go off initially, we're like, what's going on? So we'd open the door. So the dogs figured out that when they were outside and they wanted to come in, they, could, they, they didn't know what they were doing. But they know if I went to this spot, the door will open. And they would trigger the motion sensor so that we would open the door so they could come in instead of scratching the door or barking. The other thing that happened is they also learned that when when it went when they heard the base station go off in the house that somebody was out there, and they were on alert. So there's a lot to be said for that. Anyway, guys, uh, solar power generator recommendation. That's my last one. I'm gonna wrap up. I'm gonna piss some people off. There is no such thing as a solar generator. I'll say it one more time. There is no such thing as a solar generator, and somebody selling you a product. They are calling a solar generator is a dishonest person who is ripping you off, who does not deserve your hard-earned money. There is no such thing as a solar generator. There is a battery bank with an inverter with solar panels attached to it. No matter how they package it, no matter how they market it, no matter how they talk about it, that is all that it is. And I guarantee you, you can build one with more battery life, more solar panel, and better inverter for less money if you build it yourself and it's not hard to do. So my recommendation is you first of all understand a generator versus a solar powered system. A generator is something that is power on demand. It generates power. It is not dependent on the sun to come up or the wind to blow or it's not a generator. It is a it is a it is a power based system. Okay? Generator, we put gasoline in it, we turn a switch, turn a key or pull a string, and a specific amount of power comes out constantly as long as there's fuel for it. That's a generator. So just don't, and I'm not picking on you, true story, just don't use the term. And don't trust anybody that does. Because people selling them know better. People buying them don't. That's why I'm here. There's no such thing as a solar generator. There's only a battery system with an inverter and a solar panel attached to it and a charge controller. It is that simple, and you should go make your own. And if you don't know how to do it, you can look up on internet, on YouTube, and you find tons of people show you how to do it. It's not hard, and you're not even going to hurt yourself if you follow the instructions. All right? If you want a generator, you need to go store buy yourself a generator. And it is a great idea to build yourself a solar-powered, 
battery-based backup system and pair it with at least a small generator so when the sun doesn't shine, you can dump power from the generator into the batteries. That's how you do that. And here's a magical, magical thing. You go out and get yourself a couple golf cart batteries. You wire them together so they act like one big 12-volt battery instead of two 6-volt batteries. Okay. I'm not going to try to explain that right now at the end, how to do that. You can look that up. Don't do it the wrong way. You'll screw shit up. You get yourself a charge controller. You get yourself a couple solar panels. You hook the solar panels up to the charge controller, and you hook that up to the batteries, dump power into it. You hook your ass up uh, an inverter that will run based on the power level of that system, and you go get yourself a generator that will produce enough power to fully charge that system. You get yourself a battery charger to do that side of it. And you make sure that generator is a little bit bigger than what you need to dump into those batteries. So while you're dumping into the batteries, you can run other things with the generator. And you have just built a scale model of a battery-based, solar-powered, off-grid system for your house. And the only thing you will need to do to make it power as much as you can afford to make it power in your home is make it add more batteries and more panels and more inverter. That's it. You just taught yourself to go off-grid by building a simple battery-based, solar panel-based backup system. But unless you buy the generator to go with it to compensate for when the power is not there from the sun, you do not have a generator. You have a backup power system. That's what you have. Anyway, guys, really appreciate you guys hanging out today. Thanks to everybody that threw a super chat at me. That's that. It makes me feel really good. I figure you all must really enjoy what I'm doing to, to put your money up like that. I don't really ask for it. I did turn it on because I was asked to turn it on, and, and and thank you for that. Remember, if you want to support me other ways, you can join the MSB. Go to survivalpodcast.com, click on members to learn more. The sale's over, but at 50 bucks a year, it is still a deal. I promise you, if you use the discounts, Butcher Box alone, discount on Butcher Box is $10 a month. It's $120 a year. CBD products, all types of great stuff. Seeds, uh, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, things. We have all types of discounts uh, to help you out there. Uh, I believe in value for value exchange. I don't believe in donations. Uh, hopefully those of you that are super chatting me here, like Mike did today, I see you there. Uh, value offered for value given. I hope you feel that way. I don't want donations, but if you feel that I'm providing you a value, if you feel there's a value on it, you want to put on it, uh, I won't argue with that. And I appreciate you very humbly uh, for doing that. Everyone, thanks for being here today. I will catch you tomorrow. I know what you're thinking. We're going to do the permaculture part five tomorrow. No, no. Don't worry, we'll do part five, just not this week. It's preempted. Do you know why? What happens the first Tuesday of every month? Jack Spearco, myself, me, myself, and I, but two other people along with me, myself, and I, Nicole, awesome sauce, and John Willis from SOE Tactical Gear. First Tuesday chat tomorrow. All three of us will be here. We'll be on my channels and my streams, plus theirs. I'm sure it'll be a great discussion. Thank you very much. I'll catch you tomorrow.